Welcome everybody. Tonight is the uh, the uh, weekly gathering of the IND Network Inspiration and Encouragement Network. My name's Lou Jensen, and uh, we kind of put this group together years ago. There back since 1983, and we've been a gathering of engraving, carving, talented, art, airbrush, artistic kind of producing people. And the whole idea of the IND Network was to help people discover they had some talent develop that talent, master that talent, and then learn to share it. And so that, now with Hangouts, we have that kind of thing going to get together every week, a time or two, and visit about how things are working for us. We had a show last night, which was the second part of a two-part series of how to begin to price your work. And we have a seven Seven step coaching program from amateur up through professional and master of something and then begin to learn how to do a better job of marketing ourselves into the marketplace and we did that second part last night and tonight is our lab where we just get together and visit about the questions and problems and comments because there's quite a few in this film strip in the green room tonight who have a lot of experience. They've been doing this for quite some time. And obviously, if you don't know how to price your work and you're doing a poor job of your pricing, then you're not making enough money to survive. And every business has to know how to kind of control that pricing trading mechanism in order to sell their individual work. And I've always felt that artists have almost the worst time. It's the highest margin product on the planet. Out of the entire economy, art is the subject. When people get filthy rich and they bought their jet and they bought their yacht and they've got everything else, then they start buying art. And that narrow little club of people who are the patrons of art since the days of the Medici family in Italy, have they're the category. They're the ones that sustain art and artists and always have done. And so the degree of the from the one percent crowd on down through at least the top half of the economy can afford most things they want, but the bottom half of the economy can't barely afford the things they need. So they'll look at the wants, but they don't ever get to participate there a whole lot. And I think most artists have messed this part up big time, that they think all business is the same, and that things we need are the marketplace, all of it. And I'm going, no, that's one segment of the economy. The other segment of the economy are things that we want. And those two are not handled in the marketplace and the economy the same. And until you kind of separate that out and begin to understand how that difference affects the price of art and your work in particular, and how can you go from almost nothing up to incredible kinds of numbers to me seems to be a very fascinating study. And last night we had Ron Snaber on and Ron talked about his going through Ken Brown's course and learning to do engraved custom calligraphy and moving from 75 an hour up to $100 an hour. I can't imagine most calligraphers that wouldn't just be overjoyed to ter take their love and passion of calligraphy and move it into a hundred dollar an hour kind of category. And yet, Ken does it routinely and teaches exactly how to do that. And one lady called me one, one day this complaint because Ken's course is expensive, but he doesn't give it away. And she was upset with me particularly and us as a, as a company because we promoted that kind of number and those kind that kind of money. And, and I said, you know what, lady? I said, I've listened to you. Now you listen to me. If I put an ad in the Dallas paper and said there was a part-time job available for 100 bucks an hour, do you know how long the line would be trying to apply for that job? Where in the hell can you grow your life into $100 an hour playing with calligraphy, for crying out loud? And if we were stretching the issue and blowing smoke up everybody's ear, that'd be different, but we're not. It's been done and been done and been done. Ken has been doing this for 23 years now. And and not everyone likes calligraphy and not everyone wants to go out and engrave wine and, and perfume, but damn, yeah, Tam, tell them what it's like. A 
open up your mic, Tamari, and tell them what it's like to engrave for doing perfume in the, in the big stores. Is it a hard thing to do, or is it something everybody can learn? Turn your mic on, dear. There I'm, you go. I'm trying. You're trying. I'm trying. Okay. Is that... You're live. On. Okay. Um, I had a ball. Uh, I mean, when I do it, I just have a ball. I love working with the customer. Um, I love showing off my skill. Um, I loved playing with the kids and, and putting their names on the little glass uh, rocks. Um, I, I went uh, one particular time to do just Angel Perfume. It was a closed event just for Angel Perfume. I was only supposed to work maybe three, four that day, and uh, they just kept asking me to stay. They had so much demand for it. Your computer's in overload, I'm guessing. I got paid well, my extra effort. And staying with them, I got a whole bunch of perfume. <laughs> so there's lots of Long ways times. to get lots of Did ways I get to get it for that one particular it. lady. Tell us how yeah. hard it is to do it or to learn to do custom calligraphic engraving. Well, the Ken Ken and I sat in the back of the class at Sarah's why his wife was taking the gun stop class and uh, I hope we didn't disturb anybody that day but I he giggled at me and I giggled at myself I didn't do extremely well when I first started and uh, but he stayed with me and was very very kind about showing me how to do it and um, when people ask me about his class I tell them they're going to learn a great deal about the engraving and how to do it, but they're but what they're going to learn in the way he markets and he gives he gives you such confidence, just like Keith and Craig and Joe. They give a lot of confidence when they teach their class that you can do it, and um, that kind of sounds familiar to me, doesn't it to you, that me can do a thing? <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I've i really appreciated Ken's help in, in teaching me and um, I'm excited that Tamika's going to go and I, 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 this has been a fun, fun ride guys, I, to get to know all of you, to have you in my life, to have the masters and to see what they've been able to accomplish. I I don't think I could have a better life. Well, the 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 side of being able to figure out what can I do, and how can I do better at that in the marketplace, and that's kind of to me is what we we're talking about. What I'd like to discuss tonight. First of all, let's open the door. For anyone that has a comment or a question from what I presented yesterday, I got quite a few emails, and several of the comments were mostly, "Tam, you need to cut your mic in between your conversation, kiddo. It's you got a really funny background going on." There we go. There we go. So, any of you who who have a comment and want to say something now. One of the one of the emails I got was that it's about the most unusual approach to pricing that they've ever that they've ever been through, and I hope so. Good God, if, if in my whole life is if you're coming at everything the same old thinking all the time, you're going to get the same old results, and you need to guess whose problem who thinking is the biggest problem. Our own, our own, and part of. Part of my life was my dilemma as I tried to move out of dentistry and move into custom engraving to make a living. I didn't have a company to begin with. All I was interested in was, well, I wonder if this will work, and I wonder if this will work. 
and then I had two or three things that worked pretty good, and I started carving goose eggs or uh, turkey eggs, and selling them at a Park City uh, uh, jewelry store. And we sold them for fifty fifty dollars a piece. That meant I got twenty five dollars for each, and I could cut that damn egg shell in fifteen minutes. And that was a hundred bucks an hour. And and man, that got my attention. I just going, wow, crap. You mean there's something out there that could compete with dentistry per hour? All of a sudden, it felt to me like there was maybe a shot, maybe a chance. And I. I had promised myself I couldn't quit dentistry unless I find something that could outproduce it. And I think most people forget the evolutionary progress of our lives. We we make changes by little little adjustments. There's usually not these great big earth shaking major moments in our life. Jose's been a long time coming. To get that one carving this year for twenty-four thousand dollars was you gotta know how good he felt with that. And he was calling me, and we were discussing pricing and trying to come up with it. And then I gave him a really good way to move it from sixteen thousand to twenty-four thousand, and he made six thousand more because he did a little consulting with me than he might have made had he just laid it down with sixteen thousand where he was going. And most of this comes out of some 35 years of doing. We've been playing with this concept for a long time. And so when you're new, you just don't know. You don't know what is reasonable or how basically to play those cards and learn so that you can trade yourself on a better basis. Okay, questions, comments. Anybody got anything else they want to roll your hand up and all? Mel? I got, I got a comment. Do boy, the um, if you take the basic materials that make up the Mona Lisa, you have about fifty dollars worth of material. <laughs> <in different prices. laughs> good, but, good analogy. But try to buy it for that. <laughs> yeah. So, what makes it the most priceless painting in the world? I think that is where that fits. I think it really is. So what makes it so freaking valuable? Well, for one, Da Vinci had been dead for a long time. Yeah. That helps. So do you have to die to get paid for your work? He never got... Oh, I mean, he didn't get paid for that one. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, you just have to... Have faith in yourself, as and trust your own thinking as to what your your value is, your knowledge that you picked up over the years. So and when you said last night how many years it, it takes to do something, when someone asks you how long did it take you to do one of your bracelets? It's a lifetime. A lifetime. I've been working on it all my life. So, does a person, do you think a person moving into the economy as a trader, a producer, demonstrates their lack of confidence fairly quickly and quite easily? And oh, yeah. They're a nervous wreck. They're a wreck. And they, they can, you just scream amateur. It's just, that's uh, as if you can't go an art, through an art show and spot who's the pro and who's the amateur, then you shouldn't even be in business. You just yeah. that ought to be just about as obvious as a three dollar bill. And once you set a price, stick with it. You don't have to discount it because Joe Blow can't afford it. If they truly want it, they'll figure a way around to get you the money. They will. Tammy and I were just talking about that today. That very thing. Is once you set the price. Now that's that's a, and almost another another show. I've been thinking about developing a show about how to trade. What goes on when you're trading something of value and you have money in between? So here's the producer and here's the consumer, and you're trading. A good salesperson, a good trader, will have a platform or a trading position 
in between them. And the trader is the one that controls that. They're the one that set it up. They're the one that controls that moment. And so there's quite a bit there. But the number one card in that is you have the price and you set the price and then you shut up. You do not, most amateurs will talk themselves out of it. You walk up and they'll say, good hell, that's a thousand bucks, that's too much. And the public will, will express that, especially the bottom half of the economy. They'll say, oh wow, that's way too much. What's the best answer from that moment when someone says that's too expensive or it costs too much? Does anybody know? For who? For the producer. What's the very next thing you should say? If someone says it costs too much, you say compared to what? It's a very hard thing for a consumer to answer that, that statement. Compared to a gallon of ice cream or a gallon of gasoline? Compared to what? No, what? no, no don't, don't give them an example. Just make them, make them. They say it's too much and you say compared to what? Then they have to come up with something. And when it's our stuff, there's no comparison. What, what do you compare it to? A Rolls Royce or a, or a bicycle? It's really a very, that's old salesman tactics. That's old salesman card when someone says something's too expensive the very next words out of your mouth should be compared to what and continue I've heard Tammy use that line many 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 times because when they first bump into us and our systems usually one of the comments is it seems a little expensive compared to what compared to what? yeah but if they truly have the vision of what can be done with it, they'll accept the price. They'll, they'll figure it out. No, they will figure it out. They will figure it out. Because the first my, time I saw you, I should have bought it then because it was <laughs> only fifteen hundred. <laughs> I raised the price on it. Didn't I? You yeah, sure did. Yeah. You doubled it. <laughs> <laughs> you doubled yeah. it. I think Ed Abels is saying the same thing, aren't you, Ed? Didn't you see me a number of years ago? Yes, I did. And unfortunately, I kick myself every time I think about it because your systems were a lot cheaper back then. And I, if I'd have, if I'd have made up my mind right then and there to jump on it, I could have got away with a really nice system for a lot less money. I'm, and then uh, when I hooked uh, up hooked up with you guys a couple of years ago, you know, after I started school and everything, and got back in contact with you, and I was thinking to myself. Wow, this system has really gone up in price. <laughs> Why didn't I buy it when I had the chance? Yeah, <laughs> well, I didn't have the cash back then. <laughs> I didn't either. In one, yeah, that, was my, uh, that was my excuse, but I could have got it. I just, I didn't, I didn't see what I see now because I was a whole lot younger. Yeah. I mean, hey, we're talking, we're talking almost twenty-five, what thirty years ago, when I first yeah. came upon this. I came upon the advertisement and everything. I called and got one of the first catalogs, and I looked at that and I said, "Man, there's got to be something here." But I can't afford it. Nick, if I'd have jumped on it right then and found a way to do it, I'd have been. Nick's had his kid a long time. What did you pay for your your system, Nick? And how long have you had it? Um, do you remember? I bought uh, kind of and. To me, the prices don't seem like they've changed a lot. Um, it was uh, the business system, and I was thinking it was in the neighborhood of thirty-five hundred. Yeah, about three, three thousand, three thousand, three thousand yeah, five hundred or so for the. The has been our business package, and that's been pretty much where it's been for quite a long time now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but back in '86, it was fifteen hundred. Yeah. yeah. This is ninety-five. Yeah, when I saw you in uh, in the seventies, uh, let's see, the late seventies, your Parapack system was around, uh, I think, nineteen hundred. You had a price for the that, nineteen hundred. First kit, first kit and, I ever sold was was two grand, and we didn't even really have a company yet. A guy from. Uh, from Steamboat Springs, Colorado, was a friend of a friend, 
and I had helped my neighbor learn how to carve and do engraved windows, car windows. And so he took the drill in a cardboard box, literally, and a compressor, and he went over to Steamboat Springs, and they went down to that truck stop on the north end of town, and he and Craig made 480 bucks that night from engraving truck windows at the truck stop. <laughs> and Craig called me on the phone. He says, Louie, this guy wants a kit. And I says, what's a kit? <laughs> and he says, he wants you to teach him everything this drill will do. And he's willing to come over to Vernal and, and have a class with you. So he says, everything he needs, equipment, and then a couple of days of training. And he says, what should that cost? And I said, I had no clue. I just said, two grand. Yeah, that's where you pull a number out of your pocket yeah, and go for it. Number. Somebody mentioned that last night. <laughs> and and I'll be damned, Craig came home that next morning with a check for two grand. <laughs> and he sold six more kits in the next 30 days. So we had we had eight systems pretty damn fast. And and it was funny because I wasn't even thinking in that direction. I had thought about a kit. I really had. I've been, I'd been to a show in Santa Ana, California, and a kid just begged me, begged me, begged me to sell him the equipment and teach him to carve eggshells, and I wouldn't do it. I didn't want any competitors. I didn't want anybody even messing close to me. And for a long time, it's been quite an issue for us as a company because so many people would have, they would say, I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing. I don't, especially if you're doing well, because you don't want any competitors. And as soon as you begin to dawn on you that it's okay to encourage and teach other people what you're doing and how you're doing it, there's, there's a lot of money there when you start helping other people to solve their own personal problems. Tammy and I were talking today how there's 80 million people our age who are looking for some way to manage. And there's 10 things, I'm going to post them, repost them, it was on the stream this morning, the 10 reasons to be self-employed, the 10 really good reasons to be self-employed. And I read them to Tammy, and then I or sent them to Tam, and then I read them to my boys this afternoon. I says, I want you guys to listen to these 10 reasons why it's so good to have your own enterprise. Instead of a paycheck, you live on your own after or pre-tax dollars, and uh, and Chris was the first one when I got to read him. He says, "Yep, yep, every one of those I got every one of those cards, Dad, and I couldn't be happier." But that's only three percent of the economy. Three percent of the public have an own ongoing enterprise, and the reason is it's so challenging to get it started. Is it not? Is that not the? It's just. It isn't even uphill, it's straight up a cliff to make things work. And it's just hard for me at times. Tammy Tammy does more hand holding in the beginnings of someone that buys a kit and then has to figure out how in the hell to make it work. I've got a lady that cornered me at church this last Sunday and she says, I I've got a PhD in psychiatry, but she says I'm pretty sure I'm not very good at business. <laughs> And I said, well, at least you know, at least you are understand a little bit that there's a lot to learn, but most just just don't. Tammy, how often do you help people keep in the saddle once they learn this is really work? Well, I don't even know how I... Most people, isn't it? Your mic went back on. There you go. The mic, can you hear me now? Yeah. Because yeah. it shows my mic's still on. Okay. It still says it's on. This is nope. crazy. You're, anyway, you're there isn't, there is, I don't believe, not one, not one that I, because they become friends by the time they buy the equipment. Um, There's one that has. I've got a lady right now that's kind of stuck. That's stuck, and I'm trying to help her a great deal. 
Well, there's so, one that's yeah, here that, I, that hasn't needed a lot of help, and that's Mel Joins. All you had to do was tell Mel he couldn't do it. I don't remember helping Mel a lot. <laughs> I, don't I, I remember think. Mel helping me a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say, that's just about the opposite circumstance for you and, and also You know for what all. really bugs the crap out of me? Sorry. But it bugs me that I, I sell this equipment to you guys. You learn how to use it, and you all use it better than me. And that's not fair. Well, Jay, look at way. look at Jay's. Okay, Jay, I have to tell you, you you did the dragon, and I'm I know that you did it for me, and I so appreciate it because one day you you sent me some pictures, and I said that's that just needs a dragon on it, and uh, so he did the dragon and posted it tonight. But I I mean his work has just it is just outstanding now. I'm I'm crazy about what he does. So yeah, it's it's and Nick Nick's eggs are just spectacular. So I mean, what's the deal? <laughs> you guys all surpass me. <laughs> I I had occasion to sit and visit with Keith home in the middle of the day today, and we. We sat and visited quite a while, and I thought, and I can repeat it one more time, I can't imagine how Tammy and I's life without Keith Holmes mixed in there. It talked about coming along at the perfect time when we needed him and he needed us, and he, he came to me and he says, Lou, he says, I'm so sick of teaching school, I could croak. I've been teaching shop for 25 years, and I heard that you got out of dentistry playing with this. Can there any way this can be a retirement business for me? And so we literally sat down and made what Woody Searle put me through was this battle plan. If you're going to get from your as-is world to something better, you've got to make a plan and go after it. And Woody was fierce about holding me and my decisions to the fire till till it began to produce. And it kind of went through this with an email. One of the one of the people last night that had was watching the show sent me the email and said, "Now what next could I do?" And I basically what I said was that most artistic types would we is that I go down through the film strip and the other 90 people watching this show tonight out on YouTube or on my Google Plus account. We're averaging 92 people a night that are watching the show at some point now. And so out of all of you, who of you would say you're probably an artistic person? Raise your hand. You think you're an artistic person? Raise your hand. I want to see a hand from everybody here. Yes, everybody. Every one of you are artistic folks. So what's the number one problem in business for most artistic people? Tammy? Were you saying you're an artistic person or you want to answer that question? I, I've learned that I'm an artistic person. Okay. okay. And what Bingo. was the question? The question was, what is the number one problem in business for artistic people? What do you think that they, might be? They want to do the art. They don't want to do the business. They're scared no, they're, to they're, do they're interested in everything. Right oh, I people see. Okay. Are yeah, you're right about that. interested in everything. We, you mean we, those rainbow people? Yeah, that, oh, God, it's sparkly. Oh, yeah. I gotta, oh, and i got to do this, and oh, and then I want to do that, and that, and that, and that, and that. And, so what's and wrong in, with that? In business, you can't make money very well that way, and it's impossible to start a business if you're interested in everything. People who do well in business really know how to focus their effort until it starts to pay the bills. And that was my problem. Woody was just tough on me. Woody would constantly come after me to get me to 
keep pounding one damn nail, Lewis. You're all over the place. You do this, and then you do this, and then you're over here, and then over there. You've got to hit one nail and drive it home. Cut your microphone, Tam, can you? Mel? Yeah. Um, they got to stop thinking with their right right side of their brain and start thinking with the left with side the of their left brain. Side of their brain. <laughs> <laughs> can't get the crossover made. Just, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And and so I told him, I basically emailed him back and I says, I hope what you'll do this year is zero in on one thing and make it pay. Make it work. Don't be doing this all over the place stuff because it just doesn't pay the bills. And I know it's hard to make one thing pay. I know it is, but if you keep staying all and you try a little of this and you try a little of that, it doesn't work. So you try a little of this and that doesn't work. You try a little of this and that doesn't work. The real trick is it takes a lot to get good at anything. It, it just takes this amazing focused effort to improve the quality of your work and improve your position in the marketplace. And the pricing of your item, the marketing of your item, the branding, personal branding that's going on. I mean, there's all these business issues that affect whether the business succeeds or not. And the hardest part's the beginning. I, I, I've always, I always just, when you buy a kit, and most people are pretty crank when they first bump into this. They'll see the possibility of making 100 bucks an hour carbon a gun stock, and that lights them up pretty fast. And so if you're going to learn what I priced last night, I said, okay, then the minimum should be 60 bucks an hour. And if you're going to take 10 hours to carve a pattern on a gun, you ought to be getting $600 a gun. Boy, there's a lot of people would really struggle with trying to sell that. They just would have such heartburn trying to make that work in the economy. When in reality, that's kind of modest, actually, in our circle. Lots of people make it 100 to 150 an hour doing that. And then with the potential on the upscale thing, I, I pulled some stuff tonight. Oh, where did I put it? Damn it. I've got a couple of them right here. Um, these these are baseball bats that Wade Griffiths, one of our masters, did uh, for his kids. And all you do is take a wooden wooden baseball bat and saw it in half, and then we put some keyhole router keyholes in it right here in a couple of places, so you can hang it up either this way or vertical. This one's a vertical format for one of his kids, and this is the horizontal format. Now, if you if you learn to carve like this, most of you can see that you could cut the outline of the lettering like this with the drill. Just trace the lines. But look how much better that lettering looks when you basically reverse cut, cut it. You cut the background down and then leave the lettering alone. Now this is a stained and sealed surface, so here and here are exactly the same. So you put that stencil on and outline cut that damn thing, and then stipple cut it here and wipe some walnut, dark walnut stain on there, and that piece comes out looking like that in a heartbeat. It is one of the easiest things in the western hemisphere to, to carve. Now this is oak, or ash, and hickory. Bats are ash and hickory, so you can't, it's open grain. See how strong the grain looks right here? Open grain wood is a little tougher to carve than closed grain. And so you kind of have to do a little of this to where you can do the lettering and have it actually look and end up being okay. But I played a ton of Little League. I got four sons, and every one of them, that's, we lived on the baseball field. And I had, I was a dentist and I had enough time to coach, and so I was coach of all my kids' teams, literally. And where this came from was I would have a problem with my coaching with kids who didn't do as well as other kids when they're first starting. There's always out of a 
10, 12 boys, there's always one or two that just have such a tough time. And uh, kids who do okay get a little more accolades and a little more attention, and they go off the game feeling like, okay, I contributed and they're okay. But the kids who can't run fast or can't hit the ball or who are struggling, I know, it just killed me. They were such good kids, but they, so what I did was cut these bats in half. I just went and bought a little league bat and whacked it in half so I could have two of them. And I cut them and I put their name on it and then I'd give it to them with some excuse for their participation for the week. So once a week, <coughs> some little kid on my team got a bat with his name on it. And it was usually the kid that could run fastest from first to second. Or the kid who contributed the most for the week. And it was my choice as to who that might be. So I could give it to the kid who would maybe be least likely to get it. And so as I started to hand the bats out and everybody figured that somebody would get one for the week. You cannot believe what happened by the time the season progressed. And the better kids on the team were the last ones to get the bats. And it just ruffled kids' feathers till it was funny. Well, then, one day I made the mistake of doing a bat for one of the granddads. One of his grandsons hit a home run, his first home run. So I knew him, and I went over, and I said, Ralph, I says, take this Sharpie and write in your handwriting on Pride of Home Run to hit today, Grandpa. And all I did was take a number eight round and duplicate Grandpa's handwriting down the length of that bat. And I gave it to him. I said, why don't you go give this to your grandson? Now, I'll bet you, I just damn bet you that's still hanging in somebody's life somewhere. That's the kind of thing that just never, when Grandpa was there and saw your first home run, or Grandma, or dad or mom or anybody and the second that news started spreading in our little league program in little tiny rural Utah <laughs> it was just fun and all I did was just nudge it one whole summer and then I got the harebrained idea of helping the little league program raise enough money for next year's little league program by cutting those bats ahead of time and the kids sold them as we entered into the spring so before the season got going, we had the bats, and the little kids, the boys, went from door to door selling those little bats. Now, I discovered something a long time ago. This came from Woody Searle also. There's not a housewife in the world can say no to a 10-year-old boy on her porch selling anything. Not one. And so we turned those boys loose, and they went out and raised the money and paid for the whole program that year on selling pre-done Little League bats for the program. Now, I played with it. I didn't make a ton of money doing that, but it sure created a lot of noise in our community. And I just nudged it and nudged it and nudged it. But I have done baseball bats for Sammy Sosa and, and Mark McGuire. I've done them for Kenny Mayne at ESPN. I've done one for every president since Ronald Reagan. Uh, I've, I've just had a ball with this one thing. And I found these in the garage today, and I went, ah, you know, it just brings back this flood of memories of participation of custom, personalized stuff in the world that you enjoy already. Debbie does all these things, engraving and painting for the dairy industry, because that's your whole world out there, isn't it, Debbie? What? How come... How come you stayed with that? Is this your fascination or your... Mm, well, I grew up in the dairy industry. Okay. Uh, I grew up showing cows uh, in 4-H, and uh, we had our own farm, and um, the children are both dairy farmers, so so it's... it's um, you grew up with love, it. It's the love of the, kid, of the dairy cow, so... Yeah. I'm not milking them every day, but I can paint them. <laughs> I think personally, I used to milk them too, and I think you made a good change. <laughs> a very good decision there. When you have looked at that passion, and that's drawn you so far into this now, and you don't have to explain what you're looking at with this year, but can't you see 
that you've made a lot of progress in your studio and your name and reputation in this last year. Oh yeah, I think so. Um, the oil the oil paintings uh, that I've done for the Holstein Association for their hundredth anniversary uh, really helped. Um, that that took it even further out uh, in the world uh, for people that were collecting paintings. Mm -hmm. I mean, because they, they, the association made prints and sold prints, so uh, people were able to get something painted by me, um, and there's and it's it comes and goes uh, inadvertently I'll put something up on Facebook and I will get an email from somebody asking me if I can do something else another gift for somebody sure or, or something so so it's a request <coughs> a commission then coming to you yeah and remember the one category in the eight categories that modify the pricing last night one of them that really is quite an issue is when the customer then finds out about you and approaches you Yep. Everything changes. The price is not nearly the issue if they're coming at you or if you're going to them. And that does influence that, that moment, which is really a lot of fun. Well, I want to compliment you because I'm, I'm enjoying seeing all of you participate more and more on Google+. Your mixture there to me is still the future of how business is going to work. And all of you that are making the pioneering kind of effort to participate more and more, is going to now then roll back into your life like crazy. I got a call from Ron Snaberger just before the show started tonight, and Ron's feeling really rough tonight and he's not able to come and be on with us. But he just got an email from Dennis Litley, the chef, and Dennis wants to have Ron be a guest on one of his hangouts. Now, those of you who've been playing on Google Plus know who Chef Dennis Litley is. <laughs> He's a superstar on there. And I don't know how it happened yet. We'll let Ron talk about that next week when we get together because he was one happy camper. He was so, so wound up he couldn't hardly even talk. And I says, well, but look what you've done. He was on, on uh, uh, Fox News with Brett Bear. Think of that. And then he was just on this conference, on this this hangout, uh, consulting with the uh, Arizona Low this week, and then now he's going to be on Brett Bear. And I'm going, when is Ron Snaberger going to finally dawn on him that he's actually quite good at the advice he's handing out to all of us? Because he does it so from the goodness of his heart, the goodness of his nature, there's not a one of you, I don't think, in the film strip tonight that hasn't interact with Ron on a very positive basis because he's a positive kind of person. And yet most of us know that Ron's really struggled with his health. He's got really, really difficult back problems. And, and so to have him come and, and bother to figure out how to be on our hangouts and participate with us while we've been learning this last three years I've always thought, God, I have a feeling it's really difficult for him to do that because he would be on his phone and be literally on the floor often because he couldn't do it any other way, and yet he was here. And I think that still is the, the secret of this whole deal. Mel came up with the word of confidence tonight, and I'm kind of sure that that really is the kind of the underlining lining of the formula of success that until you have a degree of confidence in yourself and what you're capable of doing and you really have that masterly level of ownership I'm not sure you can succeed at much of anything without that and I think that may you know I, I gotta figure out how to put that into my formula because that really influences those eight decisions, those eight factors that affect the price of something handmade in the want world, cheese confidence as a factor really, really ought to be in there as well. Jay, you've made a lot of progress in the last couple of years, and can you describe to anyone listening in who's just getting started perhaps? what that degree of confidence has meant to you from shows last year to doing shows now this year, you're going into things with quite a bit more confidence than you had, aren't you? 
Oh yeah, I mean definitely. Um, you know, like I've you know mentioned a couple of times before. Um, when I did my very first show, I mean I was shaking in my boots, my knees were knocking. You know, I was scared, scared to death. Didn't know what was going to happen, how things were going to turn out, or anything else. And now, you know, I've done enough of them, been in the motorcycle world, you know, doing this, you know, for a couple of years now, where people have gotten to know me, and it's really built my confidence up. When I now have organizations coming to me saying, "Hey, we have an event coming up." Our vendors are going to be by invitation only, and we want you to be one of them. We want you there. Yeah. And that, you know, that really, you know, <laughs> helps, you know, really boost your confidence. Have these groups come up and say, "Hey, we want you at one of our events." <laughs> yeah, I know because I've experienced the same thing. You start into something, and you're so scared you can't hardly even. My first gun show was just a joke, absolutely. The guy out here started Crossroads of the West Gun Shows, and I was one of his first patrons. I went from Vernal, Utah as a young dentist, and I walked in there with the drill, and I'd done a, a muzzle loader. I'd done a couple of them. Yeah, one for my dad, one for Woody Searle, one for a friend, and then I'd done my fourth one, finally, and to raise some money for the Civil Air Patrol. And so I got a little bit of, I wonder if there's something here. So I went in, saw the news on television for the gun show, and I thought, well, I'll go do it. And I didn't get one sale, not one order. I spent two days there, two or three hundred bucks for the booth, and then also the cost of going and traveling and everything. And then I drove home thinking, well, that won't work. <laughs> I obviously didn't know enough of what I was doing to have it work at all. And I could have very easily walked away from that. You've had shows, haven't you, Jay, already, where you've not done well? Or have you knocked home run every show you've done? Oh. Well, I'm there. only getting about half what you're saying. I'm going to have to back there out and come back in. No, you're on now, Jay. You're on now. I think it just froze up for a second. Nope, he already dropped out and went back. I dare say he's had some shows where he hasn't done well. And I'll dare say that everybody here has had something that has not worked. You thought it would, and you made every effort, and then it just didn't work. How the heck do you get through stuff like that? What do you do when it just hits a brick wall? Joni? You've stayed with this as many years as anybody sitting here with me tonight. You've had your equipment a long, long time. Turn on your microphone, honey. There you go. How do you keep going, Joni Beck? Well, sometimes I do it because I need it. <laughs> okay. That's a good answer. That's not one I was thinking, but that's perfect. But uh, I enjoy, hopefully, that I would get compliments and that I could do things like that. Plus, I also think that uh, I can help someone with what I know, which yeah. may not be a lot, but to someone that doesn't know anything, it's a lot. It's a big help, isn't it? it yes. Is, and then you got that kind of help, and so now when you pass it on at the right time, People really do need a word of confidence, a word of encouragement, a word of inspiration to help them keep going. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Jose's on. I'm going to ask him too. Valencia, turn your cotton picking mic on, dude. How are you? Hi, I'm doing pretty good. You've got me doing some good. work over here. I know. You're busy working, but knock it off for just a minute. <laughs> There's two people. When I call them, Jose and Darwin Dower, if I ever call them, the damn drills on. Always, it's fun. <laughs> I love it. I can hear the pitch going. Oh, do I have to stop and talk to you, Lou? I'd rather be working. This is a lot more fun. Yeah, well, I was I was listening to you guys in uh, YouTube, and okay. I saw somebody else dropped off. So if you're on, might as well come in. Jump, jump in. I yep. need your I need your voice right now as to how in the hell have you stayed with it, Jose? 
because you had as many things not work as anyone else. We all have, we try, and it doesn't work. How do you keep coming back to it? Well, uh, it's funny that uh, you mentioned that you asked Jay, you know, as, and uh, you said that you had a show where nothing happened. I mean, I had some shows at the Dallas Safari Club that you're paying, you know, about two, $2,500, dollars for a booth, and yeah. nothing happened for two years. <laughs> you know, and then you start getting maybe one gun stock. Yeah, but barely enough to even make it. Barely, and even at that, and you lose money, and then you still come back to it. How come? Yeah. And all I'm doing is just building a reputation. You know, people uh, see you there because, you know, there's a lot of them. And one of the things that I talked to uh, some of the other people that are doing the uh, shows there is they says, well, don't worry, Jose. A lot of people, you know, they're just tire kickers. They want to make sure that you're going to be here the next year and the following year. And, you know, because they don't want to put the money down and then find out that, oh, this guy went out of business. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that's one of the things, and and you know it, sometimes it gets pretty discouraging, but you know you just keep on going, and you know one of the things that you ask me, why am I still doing it? He says, well, because the alternatives are not really that great. You know, I don't, I don't want to go work for somebody else, or you know, it just takes too much. Too much Other. of my time. So in a way, what Joni said, she Joni said while you were coming on that she keeps doing it because she needs to. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a need in each of us. This is therapy. It's actually, and and we've all commented when we get doing our art. There's just you just takes your mind away from your troubles. You can yeah. be having this this infinite amount of issues and complexity going on in your life. You sit down and start to carve and engrave or paint or draw. I, I can sit down now. I do mostly sketching right now, and when I sit down and start sketching and the news is going on, unless it's just horribly bad like some of the news has been lately, I am just busy drawing away, and it just doesn't affect me like it used to. I love how my drawing is progressing. You know, another thing that I want to touch on is uh, we were talking about last night is about pricing. Yeah, I just please. got an email uh, this morning about a gentleman that wanted me to do a carving for I guess it, I believe it's a Henry rifle but he wants me to do a portrait of his wife yeah and uh, I asked him well send me the, uh, the picture and it just happens that two and a half years ago he sent me the same pictures and I don't know uh, why we didn't do it maybe the pricing or you know it, it just didn't happen but I looked up his name and I, I had the pictures and it happened two and a half years ago. And now he asked me, well, can you do it? He says, I can definitely do it. He said, what is the, uh, the uh, time frame? He says, I can get you slotted in for maybe the end of May or June. If you would like to, you can send me half of the uh, deposit right now. And then as we get closer, I'll let you know when to send me the stock. He said, how much is going to cost me? And I told him, well... Uh, including the um, the carving of the uh, of the uh, portrait, plus framing it with scrolls and shipping is going to be eleven hundred and twenty five dollars. So he sent me back an email and says, uh, "LOL, that's more than what my rifle cost me." So I figure, well, I'm going to send him back an uh, email. Says, "Well, you think you better buy a more expensive rifle then." <laughs> <laughs> He had a chance of getting the you know cheaper back then, but you know this is what my even price. Even now, is. even now, no, God, that's great. That's so good. Oh, that's so good, Jose. And and what's the odds now? Would everybody bet that the odds are that man will still eventually have it done? I, I'd I'd bet on it, Jose. I mean, if he's come and hit your line twice. And not gone ahead, then I, all it will do is just leave it there. You yeah. don't have to back up for your price, not for one minute. I think eleven hundred is a giveaway, personally, right. especially when you're mimicking his his wife's image. No, and especially I, with what I who else, who else can do it? 
Yeah, especially when I found out uh, yesterday, I got another email uh, talking to a guy in Alaska that he's got a lodge there, and he's going to be sending me one of his rifles so that he can be a loner. And we're going to be carving, uh, I guess, like the big five of Alaska. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're really going to deck that, that rifle with, you know, um, the forearm and the pistol grip area as well. And then uh, what he's going to do, he's going to be uh, sending me one of the other rifles. It's a brand new rifle. He's going to carve the big five as well. And what he's going to do is going to give it to the first person that completes uh, the big Oh, five yeah. On yeah. his... Uh, it, then he gives him from the lodge the gun. Yeah. Oh, God, what exactly. a good idea. And then I just found out that, oh, yeah, uh, I'll be back next week, and uh, I got six rifles that I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, what a... What a so you got a little confidence now, Jose. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> you know, this is after, what, five, six years that I've been yeah. doing those shows yeah. in uh, Dallas? You know, yeah. but my God, you know, it's, it's finally paying off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it flat is. Have, have you crossed paths with Bill Janney in your career? You have, haven't you? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, I just saw him uh, uh, Feb uh, what was it, uh, the end of January. Uh, I saw him over there in uh, Vegas. Vegas. He likes that show. Right. He and uh, that show I bit. also had a breakfast with um, oh, uh, Blaley. He's one of the authors for uh, The Engravers. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, breakfast. The Engravers, with, Engravers Guild? Uh, no, it's uh, American Engravers. He published that book. Oh, okay. Everybody see that grizzly bear sitting right back there? Yeah, his, uh, let's see, his first name is Roger Blaley. Roger Blaley, yeah. yeah. He's, he's got this book, American Engravers. Excellent. And uh, he's written several books on engraving, and uh, I gave him one of my books for free, you know, dedicated to him. Yeah. And I told him, you know what, Roger? You need to do a book on carvers, you know, people that do gunstock carvers. There's a few of us around here, and, you know, that would be really nice as well. Let me see what I can do. Yeah. So yeah. put a little, a little word. Put a little plug, plug into it here. and mix it in. Well, I, I saw a piece that Bill Janney had done for me when he first got started, and I was remembering him today, too. I just was, sh I was showing the baseball bats and stuff, but Bill Janney was uh, worked for the General Motors as an electrician in their air conditioning division for I think 32 years and he bumped into me at a woodworking show and he got really excited about it because they had the big shotgun uh, safari club shotgun thing just down the street from him every year and he says all I thought of was a minor approach to me doing a business that might be a retirement business because I never dreamed it would turn into as big a deal as it has and and I know it's been his pride. I got a thank you card from him. He said, all I wanted to do was make enough money to go on some hunting trips. And he says, now it's paid for my way to visit every continent in the world. I've been on a hunting trip to every continent and written it off because it was a business reason to go play. And I, and I try and help people realize that when you put your life Jose's moved his life from the after-tax category of a paycheck and the tax is already gone to a pre-tax category. All the money Jose earns off of his engraving carving business comes to him first. And then he gets to use that money all year long in his own business effort and expense the hell out of that money for his own sake. And then he pays a little bit of taxes on the end. And when you can do that in a retirement position in your life, it's about the only way you can do it, short of robbing banks, selling drugs. I don't know much else that's out there as an option anymore. But this is a really good one. But what it takes is the same kind of degree of confidence that Joni was talking about and Mel was talking about and 
and that Jose's talking about and that Debbie's talking about is this continued confidence in what you're doing to keep doing it. To try and make one more step a little better tomorrow than what you made today. And and I gotta thank Ron one more time tonight, even though he's not here. If you're listening in or you're picking this up, Ron neighbor, I'm really proud of how much you've done. Because Ron pretty selflessly has moved past his own income producing life here and moved into this cult, I don't want to call it consulting because he's not really consulting. What he's doing is encouraging and supporting everyone else. He is very willing to put his experience out into everyone else's life to help them succeed as well. And that takes a rather extraordinary human being to do that. And you, mean, the, you mean something like um, inspiration and encouragement network? <laughs> well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Keith and I were talking today about Gary Price and his piece where the Native Americans are helping each other climb right straight up the cliff. And the title of that piece is They Rise Highest to Lift As They Go. And that's the motto of the ID Network has been since 1983. And if you can just one sense, like Joni said tonight, that there's sometimes you help another person in ways that seem so small at the moment, except you have had a little bit of experience. And as you share that little bit of experience with, with people who are beginning or who are struggling, or sometimes all it is is light the fire in somebody else because they like what it is you're doing. Jose, I want you to come back and finish up here tonight in this one and talk about what it's like when you started teaching people and how fun it is to bring someone into your studio that has not done it before and you help them get started. Isn't that the greatest thing in the world? Well, I was tricked into uh, teaching because uh, <laughs> it's one of the things that, you know, you kept bugging me that eventually, hey, wouldn't it be nice to teach you know, and then you can start making money teaching and now this. And I said, nope, I don't think I can do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not a teacher. And then I got a call from uh, a guy here in Casa Grande. He used to live down the road from here. Uh, his name is Jeff Starr. And I believe he called Tammy and Tammy referred him to me. And uh, he, when he called me, he says, hey, Jose, uh, you know, I'm just starting to learn how to carve, and I'm having problems, you know, learning how to carve, um, especially the leaves. You know, I cannot afford to do a three-day class, but, you know, is there any way that you can just show me how to do leaves just for one day? So I told him, well, sure, just come on over, you know, and we'll do that for a day, and that will be it. So, you know, I was charging, uh, oh, I can't even remember how much I charged him. I think it was... Hundred a quarter, I think, wasn't it? I, I think so. Or, or for a basic beginning class was yeah, hundred and quarter, hundred and a half, something like that for a day. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I think it was about two hundred. Two hundred. Okay. Yeah, I think it was two hundred. Yeah, because um, you know, he came over here, and I'm one of the bedrooms, and we got um, we got <laughs> on it, and then after we went to lunch, and then. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about the carvings and showed them how to do it. And then about 2.30, my wife comes in with some uh, yogurts and some, uh, you know, little treats. Yeah. And one of the things that she asked him, he says, well, Jeff, are you getting your money's worth? He says, oh, my God, I felt so embarrassed. And he goes, oh, yes, Mrs. Valencia, look at that. This is what he showed me. Look, look what I'm doing now. I was living through this. Look at that. Taught me how to do that, so I just turn around and smile at my wife and grin, you know. <laughs> but pure justice every now and again, Jose. Every now and again, oh, <laughs> uh, it, it felt great. But you know, I didn't really, really saw it as teaching, as much as you know, helping somebody else how to do something, and that's when I realized, ah, this is what Dr. Lou was talking about, you know. So. Uh, it made me feel really good to know that 
I'm helping somebody else. And at the same time, you know, I also learned a little bit more about the carving, you know, and, and uh, developing uh, teaching skills, you know, and basically it's just showing other people how to do it and yeah. just having fun with it. Yeah. So, yeah Every that's... one of us say that the teacher learns more than the students even at that, and I think that's true. I think that really helps you to solidify what it is you do and how you do it. So my feeling is that you start out as an amateur, don't know much of what you're doing. You move through the amateur to a technician. You become somewhat of, a, of an artisan type person. You're getting a pretty good hang of it. Eventually you can become a pro where you're starting to charge for your work. And then you move up into a professional category to a trainer, teacher, and then mastery of something. And from the masteries, then when you can open that door and really have a good time. And invariably, until you've mastered something to a degree, it's pretty hard to justify charging to teach someone. And and we've got a lot. A lot of our masters just will not teach, period. They they tried a little and didn't like it. You can't get Greg, Greg Water to teach class. He just will not. He did a few of them when he first won the world championship, and then he said, <coughs> That's enough of that. I don't want to do that anymore. But others are quite inclined to it. And as you are, and you start to expand your ability to watch for people who are, when you're doing your events, event marketing is when they'll find you. And they'll hover around you and hover around you and hover around you. And they don't usually have the courage to even bring it up. So you have to notice that attention because what they're there is not to buy your work. They're very intrigued with what you're doing, and they want to learn how to do what it is you're doing. And you got to begin to start looking at the possibility of selling, helping them buy a kit through you and Tammy, and then you can teach them a class and help them learn. And when you spot that potential, it took me five years. I'm doing out doing shows and busting my butt in every direction, and I didn't want to teach anybody else. And then finally, I'm going. How's it going to hurt me? It can't hurt me if they're doing the business too. It can't. And so that's when the when the side of teaching and training. We really didn't nudge into this. We get to give Sarah Rains as the first master in our program to pass away. Sarah was engraving in Dallas, Texas and just tore up the track. She really, really did well. And Sarah burst bought her kit, played with it, tried a little bit, and called me one day and she says, Dr. Lou, I'm coming to Utah. I, I need help. I want to learn this quicker. I'm flying. I've already bought my plane ticket. I'm going to be there tomorrow, and I need some help. <laughs> and Tammy and I panicked and ran to Keith and said, Keith, oh, we got to have a way to teach somebody. Can we do it at your place? And so in 19, wasn't it 1991, Tammy, when the hand-holding started, from 83 to 91, we didn't offer company coaching and training. We just didn't even think of it. And then all of a sudden, because of Sarah Rains, we decided to, to start offering those kinds of courses. So now we've been doing that for years and years and years. And I suspect we'll continue for years and years more. Anybody want to make a statement before we wrap it up tonight? We've pretty well hit the Get the brig road running. Appreciate all of your participation. Um, if you've got other emails or other questions or comments or things you want to participate with, why send them to me and we'll get them ready and incorporate them in the shows that we're doing, okay? Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>